Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us as we look at the lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first quarter of 2013. This is number five in that series on origins, and this lesson is entitled Creation and Morality, and it's the lesson for February 2 of 2013. There's two things that we'd like you to do for us right now. Grab your Bible so that you're ready to look at some verses with us, and bow your head so that we can begin with a word of prayer. Father and God, we thank you for the guidance that you have given us in your word. And today as we discuss what the creation story might imply about how we should act, how we should behave, our morality, may we speak the truth about you and all that we do and say is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Does the God that we believe created everything have the right to tell us what to do? Yes. If he made us? What, what are God's rights as opposed to our human rights? Well, he's our father. Okay. So, so we're, all, all we like, we're all running around like a couple of two-year-olds and God has to constantly tell us what to do? I, I, I just bristle mm -hmm. uh, when you use that expression, tell us what to do. Yes. Uh, I would much prefer that uh, you might say that he would tell us what is best for us to do for our longevity, our uh, mm -hmm. uh, happiness. Uh, okay. it, 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 it comes across a, a little, like bit, little better, yes, <laughs> I, I think so. But well, here's does the he have the right to tell us what to do because he created us? Yes, he does, but he has chosen to do it otherwise. Well, well, yeah. Let's 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 say it in a way that makes God look good. Yeah. Well, Adam, God said to Adam, "You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden. Yes, you may, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day." Is that God telling us what to do? For his own good. It's good advice. <laughs> it's good advice, okay. And if you grow up in a permissive home, you would really appreciate good advice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing for God to give good advice. Wouldn't that be horrible if God knew something and he didn't say anything and he just yeah. let Adam do it? But at yeah. least Adam was warned. That's a mark of love. Well, human beings love to talk about our rights. Many would like to feel completely free to do whatever they want to do. The Magna Carta signed in 1215 and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen proclaimed in 1789 are just a couple examples of demands by so-called subjugated populations for the exercise of their inalienable rights. Well, you know, we're doing that now. How mm -hmm. many states passed yeah. legalization of marijuana? Yeah. And they're finding out, let's just vote the stuff that we want in. We can change morality by voting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we as human beings have some inalienable rights? Yeah, until you get a tyranny or a despotism. Then. But what is the relationship between rights, privileges, and responsibilities? Could you define the word inalienable? Inalienable means that it's an inherent part of you and nobody can take it away. It comes from God. Governments don't give them to it. Governments we have, have an no rights. have inalienable right to think. Yeah. Well, is there rights that come from God or not? Sure. Well, that must well, be good. That's the question. Then. The only must place be good there is a, God is a source of rights. There's nothing, no other entity has, has rights to give. Now, to when, when somebody says, okay, everybody has the right to own a house. Everybody should own a house. Everybody should have the right to health care. Yeah. Um, that that right seems too. a little different than what we're talking about here. Yes. So Doesn't God give us the right to choose? Yes. And that would basically be the only right well, that we have. Well, what about freedom based no. on the truth? Yeah, well, that's what she's talking about, the right yeah. to choose. Yeah. But God also gives us the right to life. This I mean, we, we wouldn't, what? 
He is the source of love. Yeah. There's a document that says inalienable rights are the life, the liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. So our founders... Was that the Constitution or the yeah. Declaration, Declaration of Independence? Declaration of Independence. So our founders defined inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. They said they were self-evident, so they're not defined. <laughs> yes. So if they're self-evident, that means they're there already. If you don't recognize it, well, then you just don't see. So we know this is <laughs> not true. Yeah. We, okay. we know yeah. that wasn't true then, and it's not <laughs> really true even this, to this day. What is that? I, That's not true. That, okay, at the time they were writing this, you know, uh, there were egregious things happening around the world. Mm -hmm. As they were saying those things, it wasn't true. Because a, a part of the, uh, hum, human beings, uh, black people, yeah. were like a percentage human and you could do this. Whenever you want to hurt or kill somebody, first you have to vilify that person. Like you want to kill a baby, it's not a baby, it's a fetus. You want to destroy a group of people, they're not people, they're savages. You know, this was happening when this was written. Mm -hmm. So we know it's not really, really, really true. That's not what God was talking about it at all. It became true. Maybe the guy who was making fun of, uh, well, I shouldn't say making fun, he was having fun with the Declaration of Independence, said he made a, one for bachelors. you know about the one for bachelors? No. Instead of the pursuit of happiness, it's the happiness of pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story of ancient Israel, as chronicled in the Old Testament, is a long history of a group of people claiming their privileges or rights while trying to avoid as far as possible their responsibilities. Is that phenomenon still taking place in our world today? Mm -hmm. Yes. Some politicians wish they could somehow magically solve all problems by casting a vote. If we could, if we could would we vote to make all of ourselves millionaires? I think they're doing, trying to do that. <laughs> Why do we limit voting rights to certain groups? Are we hoping that they will act responsibly when they cast their votes? Well, that's a, we have trouble with that. Think about where we came from. Did God literally come down to planet Earth and mold Adam from the dirt? Some translators have suggested that instead of dust, it should be clay or perhaps clods, which would certainly be easier to mold. Have you ever tried to mold dust? Did God <laughs> need it to be easier? No. How precise an image of Adam did God make before he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? Did he do a, do he do to Michelangelo's David before he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? Was it a perfect image? How intimately does God want to be involved with his children here on this earth? Imagine his descending upon Mount Sinai and all that happened there and then feeding the Israelites daily for 40 years besides looking after their clothes and their sandals so they wouldn't wear out. I mean, imagine God coming to you and says, Yoli, for the next 40 years, I'm going to take care of your clothes and your sandals, your shoes, and nothing is going to wear out. Yay! And you said every day. <laughs> and they would fit perfectly. They would go with you, with you and they would shrink with you. And I think that may happen again in the end times. Yeah. We may have indestructible clothing and mysterious food. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds boring. boring. Right. Sounds boring? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine 40 years of eating one food? Yeah, oh, I cannot. If it's manna, I can. <laughs> Turning Maybe. back. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, if that does happen, we better not grumble about it. No. Yes. <laughs> I wish yes. you had some quail. <laughs> well, turning back to the experience of Adam and Eve, what was the purpose of that tree of knowledge? Why did God allow it even in the garden? I mean, why do we need one thorn there? It was a test of if they were going to follow God and trust God, or if they were going to turn their back on God, what God said, and trust this other being. Wouldn't it have been better for God just to leave the test out? Enjoy. For some reason, he had to have the test in. Well, what so was that reason? Yeah. What's the reason? Joanne yeah. points out is one idea about why the tree of knowledge and good and evil is there. Is there another idea? Yes. There's a very potent other possibility. The tree was put there because, as we read in Revelation 12, 
the devil and his angels had already been cast down to this earth. And as soon as God is ready to do something on this earth, guess who says that they must be a part of it? The devil says, if you're going to make new creatures, then I have to have access to them. And God, instead of saying to the devil, oh, have at it, you can follow them all around the garden, wherever they go, behind every plant, behind every flower. Oh, here I am. God says, no, you are limited to one tree. You can have access to the, to the garden. You can have access to, the, to them. But this is your place, one tree. Now, he didn't put that tree at the farthest corner of, I don't know what, wherever the edge of the garden was, so they would never find it. He put that tree right close to the, to the uh, tree of life that they had to eat of every, every day in the middle of the garden. So he wasn't being unfair, but he said, Satan, you can't pursue them everywhere they go. If they choose to come to you, that's one thing, but you can't pursue them. I think there's more to the story than just that. Okay. That, that there's a problem in the universe. Mm -hmm. That God has a problem on his hands. And um, he allows Satan. He places Satan in the garden. Not just the tree, but places Satan in the garden. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of open disclosure. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? You go to sell your home. Your realtor is going to ask you to fill out several pages. Uh, asking you questions. Have you ever had a mold problem? Do you have a... Uh, an underground oil storage tank. Uh, do you know if anybody moving or industry moving into the neighborhood that could devalue the property? Let's say you're going, you're, you are going to issue stock for a company you own. Uh, you have to prepare what's called a prospectus to inform prospective shareholders of various mm -hmm. issues. Is there a lawsuit from a customer a vendor, even an employee. Mm -hmm. God has a problem, and he is sharing that with Adam and Eve mm -hmm. for a purpose to settle this rebellion, which has gone on throughout the entire universe. Mm -hmm. That God has a purpose much beyond the creation of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. He is trying to restore security to the universe. Security that will be even greater than before Lucifer rebelled. Mm -hmm. Because Lucifer did rebel, we know that he could. But we understand from Revelation that after this world is made new, there will be no more mm -hmm. sin. There will be no more sorrow, suffering, tears, and death. Yeah. So what's happened? Something has changed between the time when Lucifer was created and the time when the world is yeah. made new. So what is it that's changed? Well, so you're just you're just you're saying that um, that this is all a part of some. When Satan got casted out of heaven, that wasn't the end of everything. Right there, there was more coming up to deal with him, is to deal Precisely. with what happened. Precisely. And think. it's not just, you can't just look at um, Adam and Eve, just them isolated about, mm -hmm. you know, with the devil. You have to look at the whole situation, put the whole thing together. Yeah. And this problem that arose was not something that caught God by surprise. No. This was, a, in God's foreknowledge, Isaiah 40 through 55 explains some of those things. God knew what was going to happen. And we say, well, why? And why does evil exist? God is love. And with, you have to have a choice, opportunity to choose between living in harmony with the Creator or attempt to go your own self-centered way. And there are consequences to going your own self-centered way. Sin destroys. It isn't God that destroys. God doesn't have to, you know. No. We're not self-existent. To, to follow up with, with, with what Gary was suggesting, if we draw a timeline of what we know, from the Bible. We, we can go back to the creation of Lucifer. We know that he was created. And we can go far forward as far as the, the world is made new. Mm -hmm. Beyond in either extreme, we have no information. Except so, God. God sure. extends beyond it in both directions. Sure. But we have this on this timeline, we have the rebellion in heaven. And the very next thing, 
is this world is being created. Mm -hmm. And so few Christians even, mm -hmm. so few, dare I say, Adventists, mm -hmm. tie the two together at all. Mm -hmm. Now, if God threw Satan and his angels to the earth, why didn't God just leave them there and create humans on another planet? Why because did Satan God would have demanded to be there. Why okay, does, so... Why does Satan have any right to demand mm -hmm. anything? Well, that's our question. Wh wh who has rights and, and where do those rights come from? One third of the angels believed him. Mm -hmm. And the other two thirds, many of them had questions until the cross. If I may put it... The, because the, they were all friends. Sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you. Because all the angels sure. were all like family. Mm -hmm. So they had questions one third fell away and... Lucifer's so arguments were that compelling that one-third believed him even though they were in the presence of God and... So you know, we're, yes, if I may play devil's advocate, we are parents, wish one of us would put our children around a table and put well, rotten apple and whatever, or maybe good apples and put one, or put one shiny, well let's change it, put a shiny gun in the center red and said you could touch all these toys let's change it to toys but do not touch that gun how long would it take for yeah. a child to run and grab that and knowing that once they grab it they would you know chaos death everything bad would happen there i think there has to be more to it than that than just what we understand well let, let's let's look at that now for a moment did God explain to Adam and Eve what he meant when he said, in the day you eat of it, you will die? Nope. No record. Yeah, no precedent. Notice for one thing that this idea that God created, he says, now, if, you die, if something happens, you will die, uh, that's a direct contradiction to the theory of evolution. He's implying that this is the first death. And evolution has lots of deaths coming up to this point. But God said that sin and disobedience would prove deadly. Did, go on, did God go on to explain? Did he just say, Father knows best? Have we ever heard that before? <laughs> did God have a right to tell Adam and Eve what they could and could not do? Is that why he told them what not to do? I don't look at it as a, necessarily as a right. I think the Creator knows how th the universe runs. He knows how... He, uh, individuals uh, function and, and that have individuals have choice how they function and God is like a parent and a parent has a duty to teach his kids mm -hmm. and if you f look at it from that angle uh, the way I put it together it's a whole lot easier than some of these uh, schizophrenic uh, yeah. concepts. When, when children are very young parents tend to give them a lot of direction much to the dismay of the children usually as they become older and of course as they become teenagers they begin to feel like they're big enough to fight back. And what usually happens more or less in various forms at that point in time is the parents say, okay, so long as you're living under, in my house and eating my food and dependent upon me for your necessities, then my rules apply. Is that fair? Because you know who I'm going to compare it to in just a moment. <laughs> Yes, that's fair. I think that's a parent that is tired of explaining and explaining and explaining, so they just say, while you're in my house, you do. But there are good reasons for those rules. Well, why do you have to explain and explain and explain? It's because you haven't experienced it yet. I mean, sometimes God has to tell you about things that you haven't experienced, and you've got to take his word for it. Yeah. And that's a good... Look at some there. passages. In scripture, Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. We are the people he cares for, the flock for which he provides. Listen today to what he says. Don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn. Look at Psalm 100. It's a short psalm. Maybe we can read all of it. Sing to the Lord, all the world. Worship the Lord with joy. Come before him with happy songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people. We are his flock. Enter the temple gates with thanksgiving. Go into its courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise him. The Lord is good. 
His love is eternal and his faithfulness lasts forever. That's quite a description. And then Acts 17, we've looked at these verses before. Acts 17, 25, I'm, re I'm going to just read verse 25 and 28. Nor, now this is Paul's presentation before the um, Areopagus, the, the city council, will, 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 if you will, the, the philosophers in Athens. Nor does he, that is God, need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And dropping down to verse 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Okay? I love these words from Ellen White. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Review and Herald, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15. What do you suppose she meant by that? There's a lot of fingers around pumping the, everybody's okay, heart. Okay, let's, let's be a little bit more <laughs> honest with the no, text. No, well, listen, I, I am being honest a little bit because you have to look at the, you have to look at the symbol, symbolism of that. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't, you're going to get ideas like that. God is more involved in our world than we even know. He knows the numbers of hairs on our head. He's helping our heartbeat. Mm -hmm. He knows when a sparrow falls. Yeah. And he is the one who made the rules by which your heart beats. That's what ma that's what that amounts to, okay? Can I go back to yeah. the song in joy? Mm -hmm. Why is why are Adventists so against the joy part? If, uh, I wasn't able. <laughs> oh, I wasn't able to go to the heritage singer. They're kind of lively, and everybody looked like they're on a, at a funeral. <laughs> you know, no one moves. Why is that? But I went to a church where they were dancing in the I front and dancing down. So I mean, it's like uh, there's two sides, yeah, and that made me feel. Church. A non-Adventist non Adventist church, oh, yeah. I and think there's not a lot of th serious thinking going on when you're dancing around and. No, I don't mean like really dancing around, but it's the, they don't feel it. It's just mm -hmm. different strokes for different. Yeah, folks. just let them, let them be who no, they are. No, I am not going that far either because I'm. Oh well, no, why run not? Down the why aisle. not? God has nothing to do with all. If you like, if idea. you like the music, you just say I, yes. I <laughs> like it. Amen. I, one time I said amen. We all like just turn around and look at me like. Oh. Okay. Oh, I would rather so be with um, very serious, self-controlled type people. It doesn't bother me in the least to be around. I mean, because I taught school, high school for 31 years, you know, and uh, I, I appreciate very serious people. So. You know, we, got, <laughs> we have a sign. We have a sign under that camera. It says, smile. Why is that there? <laughs> so much of those hours. Well, these verses suggest that God is good, that he intends good for us. He gives us not only life, but also purpose. He shows us how to love. I mean, he is himself love. We need to be thankful to him for what he does for us. What should be our response to all of that? Would we dare to suggest that our response should be obedience? Well, look at Genesis 1, 26 to 20. Why do you define obedience? Okay. Obedience in the Bible, but it's, I know the Greek better than I do the Hebrew, but the Greek, the word for obedience in Greek is hupakoe. It means l literally under listening. It means listening under, listening with a humble attitude. And you don't want to spend too much time listening if you can't trust the person that you're yeah. listening to. So you got to make that determine there's somewhat of a progression or an order to, yeah. to things. Well, I understand that, that we need to obey, but that, that again goes back to, uh, I've said it, you do yeah. it. We're, we're uh, coming to that. And I Thanks. would prefer, prefer that we, we understand that, that to obey is, is, to, is to live by the rules. The rules which will allow us to live together in harmony for eternity. Well, you know, 
I saw this precious relationship between a mother and her child. We were in water aerobics class and we had all our little toys out there, the noodles and the dumbbells and stuff. And when the class ended, the mother and the daughter were just, you could just see they had a good relationship. The little girl ran around and picked up all the stuff and was putting it away for us. The mother didn't have to say, this is what we need to do. The daughter was absolutely delighted to be able mm -hmm. to be doing something for the mother. And I think that is our relationship. There should be such love with God that we are delighted without him even asking to do what's mm -hmm. needed. And, and it was I just the precious, most precious sight. I, I saw a good relationship. Yeah. Well, God said, let's look at the verses, God, Genesis 1, 26, 28. Then God said, and now we will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them and said, have many children so that your descendants uh, will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge of the fish, birds, and animals, and so forth. So he's suggesting what? We have a responsibility mm -hmm. to care for the fish, birds, and animals. Well, notice this, and this is from our Bible study guide. Notice, too, that God purposed to make man in our image. That is, an image involving the plurality of the Godhead. Then he made humans male and female. The image of God is not fully expressed in an individual, but in relationship. As the Godhead is manifest in three persons in relationship, the image of God is, in humans is expressed in relationship of male and female. The ability to form relationships is part of the image of God. Relationships, of course, imply responsibility and accountability, which means morality. Hence, right here we are given a strong hint as to how morality finds its basis in the creation story. That's in our Bible study guide on Origins, page 40. Could you say that really morality started in heaven before even creation because sure. the angels had to have relationships mm -hmm. and, and they, something went wrong with relationships up in heaven? Yeah. Well, if God is a three-part unity, and if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in perfect harmony, and furthermore, if we are to be like them, what does that imply about our lives and our relationships? If God is love, and you know the verses in 1 John 4, 8, and 16, are we to be love also? Is that what's implied? If God is totally respectful toward us and even allows us the freedom to reject him, should we be respect? Should we be respectful of others around us? Absolutely. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Well, here's the challenge for scientists. None of us who are literate in the fields of physics, chemistry, and biology would deny that human beings are made of inanimate materials. Electrons, protons, neutrons are what our bodies are made of. We could go further and say that our bodies are made up of molecules, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, hormones, etc. So how does it happen that the same or similar chemicals are amoral, that is, they have no moral implications, when they make up animals, plants, beetles, fleas, or even snakes, while we as human beings are expected to be moral and responsible beings and we're made of the same materials? Is there any essential difference in the matter that creates us uh, that makes us up human beings as compared to those of other creatures? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? So you're saying that animals do not have relationships and morality? Well, they don't have a moral code. The Ten Commandments wasn't given to the, to the dogs or the cats. Um, you know, they can be trained, they can be induced to do certain things, and that's, that's fine, it's beautiful. They, but they don't do it because it is right. Some of them have relationships and some of them have long-lasting, lifelong yes. relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take great care of their offsprings. And, mm -hmm. and their spouse, yeah. quote unquote, their yeah. mate. Well, look at another verse, Genesis 2:23. Then the man said, At last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone, 
flesh my flesh, woman is her name because she was taken out of man. Okay? What does that imply? I don't know if the women appreciate the name woman anymore. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. I think women have done women a disservice with all th with the things they want. I want, you know, I want the the way a man that a man is supposed to be a real man, a man that take care of things, that's the head and the, does all this stuff. But women now want to, some women have robbed themselves of a lot of things, yeah, good things. Well, let, let's be honest in terms of here. We're all descended from Adam, one human being. And very soon after that, Eve joined him right on the same day. And now as a couple, as, as the first parents, we're all descended from the two of them. Uh, Adam gave his wife a name derived, we have the Hebrew, a, wor a word that means her, her name was to live and means something like life giver. Thus it is literally true that we are all part of one family. More than that, we have just one Father in Heaven, and you know the verses for that. Should that imply human equality? Human equality with God Himself? Or, not necessarily with God Himself, does it mean that if God, if we all started out with the same parents exactly, and now we've, we've, we've spread apart and we've done all this kind of stuff and differences and whatever, are we still equal? Should we still be equal here on are this you, earth? Are you speaking equal as people or equal in Equal function? as people. Equal. Of course we should be equal with our other races here on this planet. As Is that what you're beings. saying? Yeah. But it, it goes beyond race because India, mm -hmm. they're the same race, but you, they, the way they live is so deplorable. They have some people that they only eat rats and they're untouchables and what have you. You have a group here and a group. I mean, it's unbelievable. And people go there to get enlightened. Yeah. That's <laughs> true. Well, <laughs> look at Proverbs 14 31. If you oppress poor people, you insult the God who made them. But kindness shown to the poor is an act of worship. What does that imply? Be kind. Well, unfortunately, after the entrance of sin, we have come to recognize that we are all born sinners. We are born inherently selfish. As infants, all we concern ourselves with, with is our immediate needs. Ah! You know, I need something, right? There's no planning for the future, but as we grow up at what? I'm still like that. <laughs> yeah. But as we grow up, but hopefully mature in every way, we begin to see beyond the immediate future. Satan's approach has always been an, an intensely selfish one. Like him, many human beings today only think of immediate gratification, do not want to think about future consequences or responsibilities. Unfortunately, down through the generations following the experience at the Tower of Babel, human beings have been divided politically, nationally, ethnically, and economically. Various groups and individuals have tried to bridge some of these gaps with mostly poor results. What should be the role of Christians in dealing with rich and poor, Jew and Gentile, neighbor and foreigner? Do some people have the right, based on social Darwinism as we call it, to dominate others because they are richer or stronger or more politically connected? Are you saying that morality the root of morality is your selfishness or unselfishness? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question. Is that true? I mean, what we have are two systems here. We have Satan in his very selfish system. We have God in his loving system. Does it make a difference how you behave based on which of those systems you believe? If we're yes. discussing morality and origins, mm -hmm. we come to the dichotomy of uh, the origins uh, occurring naturally, uh, uh, evolution uh, through the survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Well, then, then maybe that's correct that we should be dominating our neighbor. Uh, but if that is true, 
then how how does how, God comes down here to forgive us of all that? But that's how He created us. Yeah. Well, that would be theistic evolution, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, it seems preposterous. Yeah. Well, if God intended for us to be like Him in many ways, the most important of which is to be like Him in character, then we need to understand what that character is like. For starters, look at Matthew 5, 44 to 48. This should be familiar to all of us. This is part of the first section of, of Christ's Sermon on the Mount. But now I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is that a natural human instinct? No. 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 So that you may become the children of your Father in Heaven. Do we want to be children of our Father in Heaven? Yes. For He makes His sun to shine on bad and good people alike. We can't deny that. And gives rain to those who do good and those who do evil. We can't deny that. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect, just as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Oh dear. There's a saying, um, be careful what you think, because a thought turns to an act. Mm -hmm. And then the acts, as you do them, become habits and the habit defines your character. Mm -hmm. So it all starts with the thought. Mm -hmm. And I think God is telling us there, think good thoughts, and therefore you will develop good character through that process. What, what's implied by loving your enemies and being perfect? Do you have to be perfect to love enemies? No. Or if you love your enemies, are you perfect? You m mature. If you, love your <laughs> if you love your enemy because you don't want to be give evil for evil because then that's not what God is about. And being mature means being able to see that what you're doing is wrong and I'm not going to get to your level and give you the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go above that and ask God to maybe change your heart and bring you, raise your bar a bit. Well, it's kind of, to me, it's like going up to a child and watching him do something stupid and you tell him to grow up <laughs> grow up and but you know he can't grow up but he is growing so yeah. uh, when he's he says to be perfect that's exactly what he says to all of us be perfect uh, now, we're growing up now the word perfect there means mature mm -hmm. fully mature grown up <laughs> well, Jesus, when he looked at Jerusalem, he wept, and he knew what Jerusalem, Jerusalem was going to kill him. And so he prayed for Jerusalem, he felt bad for Jerusalem, but uh, didn't he stay away from it as, as um, he preached other places and stuff mm -hmm. and he didn't go there? So is that a, a model of how we're supposed to do with our enemies, feel sorry? Uh, weep for them, pray for them, but not necessarily do we have to be around them. We can maybe... How can we love them if we're not around them? <laughs> pray for them, but if they're going to harm you... Maybe that's how you love them, is stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to, you must. <laughs> well, what about the story of the Good Samaritan? What are we supposed to learn from that story? We have a statue a short distance from here at the mm -hmm. center of the university. The Good Samaritan. Take care of those that are in need. No matter who they are. Mm -hmm. No matter who they are. Love. Regardless of whether they're part of our group. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a question was raised about, a, let's say, if you see a homeless person with a card and do you give him money if you know he's going to drink with the money? And I've heard that a lot of times. And when I have, I give it because I know they don't just drink. They eat. They do other things. If they do take what I give, if they take what I give him and go drink, it, even in the Bible it says drink and be merry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't do all, I don't judge everything. Well, the ultimate example of unselfish behavior is described in Philippians chapter 2. 
Let's look at that for a moment. Your life in Christ makes you strong, and His love comforts you. You have fellowship with the Spirit, and you have kindness and compassion for one another. This is, this is the uh, Christian ideal. I urge you then to make me completely happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, and being one in soul and mind. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another. Always consider others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interest, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had, and here's the description, he always had the nature of God. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, imagine he's, here he is, and he's the very top of the pile, he's at the very height of the uh, sovereign of the universe, he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. Imagine being born as a helpless baby boy. Sounds like he's contrasting something from somebody mm -hmm. else. Too. Mm -hmm. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. As Philip says, the death of a common criminal. Yes. That scripture kind of reminds me of uh, when good. Christ Jesus went to uh, wash the disciples' feet. And it was a lesson for us to become servant-like. Not like as servants, but as servants of love. Doing things for yeah. others, helping people. Another aspect of morality is it humility with humil humility comes obedience, where with pride comes disobedience. Mm -hmm. So morality, your morality depends on your humility also. Yeah. Well, isn't it clear by now what an incredible contrast there is between Satan's rules and God's rules? God calls us to exercise love and care for the weak. Satan calls for us to be selfish and to exploit the weaker among us. If we came up through a process of natural selection, wouldn't it be just natural for us to continue to act in that way? The Bible says that a day of reckoning is coming for everyone. We have talked about this earlier. Look at a few places. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Whoops. Sorry. After all this, there is only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey His commands because this is all that human beings were created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. You know, if there's going to be a day of reckoning, it's very good to know what is going to be the standard yeah. to which we will be judged. And I think people are trying to change the standard, and it just lays it out in the Bible. This is the standard, and God doesn't change. Yeah. Some people would be uh, would sort of poke fun at the book of Ecclesiastes. So let's try a different place. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 13. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sits on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and were seen no more. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up, what, up the dead they held. And all were judged according to what they had done. That's pretty clear, I think. Can we're, we... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Can we use uh, ethics for morality? Yes. Be, okay, good. Because the two have changed. The God's level and ours is very different because ours is a man-made created construct which really cannot be reified because we, we have a, I am, I voted for Obama for a different reason. I voted for him for what he represents to children in people, country like Haiti or children with no hope mm -hmm. that see someone like that and say, oh my God, this person looks like me and look where he is. Mm -hmm. But when you have a, somebody at that level put a seal on homosexuality and certain other things that just really kind of grieve my soul a bit. I have nothing against, you know, I think God created everyone and what have you. But from the biblical standpoint, 
for him to do that and do it openly. And now children, 11, who don't even know what they want. You have little girls on TV kissing each other and doing all. It's, it's so free for all that they're not even what they think they are. Mm -hmm. But that's, everybody's telling them everything is okay, so they want to try everything. Yeah. That sort of grieved me a little bit. Yeah. Well, Matthew 20, 12. Let's try Matthew 12, 36 and 37. You can be sure that on Judgment Day, everyone will have to, be given a, will have to give an account of every useless word he has ever spoken. Your words will be used to judge you, to declare you either innocent or guilty. That's well, a pretty that scary, is scary thought. That is scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't have time to read all of it, but Matthew 25, 31 to, to, to 40, talks about separating the sheep and the goats. And it's separating on the basis of what we did, right? In light of these passages, it must be exceedingly clear that while we are saved by faith, Acts 16, 31, that faith, our relationship with our Father God, will result in the kind, the, in certain kinds of actions. And those actions will be the basis on which God judges. Does that scare you? Yes, especially the thing about what you say. Because Jesus says what you come out of your mouth that sold you and whatever, you're not just what you eat. But I hope you're not talking about expletives. Because I, <laughs> I That's just a very small part of it. Good, because I share something with Mark Twain and President Nixon. Not so much now, but I used to. <laughs> now, how does God distinguish between your actions that um, you, you try to do something, but your heart's not right, and you, do, you still do good works, and versus good works that come out of a loving heart? That seems like well, that God has knows where they came from mm -hmm. and why you're doing them. Mm -hmm. And he will judge on the basis of our motives. Yeah. One day, everyone who has ever lived will face God's judgment. This is what our creation, evolutionist friends, some of them, the, the leaders of the evolutionary ideas, don't want to think about. At the third coming, the entire human race, from Adam and Eve to the last person living, along with Satan and all his angels, will stand before the judgment seat of God. What do we expect to happen at that point? Apparently, based on his showing of the panorama and all the details of the great controversy, and you can read about that in detail, great controversy, page 666 to 672, and once again, I would remind you that if you want to look at these materials that we have available, we use here, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, on the, on the net. God's case will be so compelling that even the devil will be down on his knees admitting that God was right. And now we can read the last two verses in that passage in Philippians 2. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, the world of the dead, will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every living Amen. creature who has ever lived. Now this uh, includes non-Christians as well as Christians. Mm -hmm. um, how many churches now che uh, teach that there is a judgment? It seems like it's something that I don't hear when mm -hmm. I listen. We don't want to talk about it. So what are God's requirements? Has God laid, us, laid on us some impossible demands? Should we fear him because he, we are perpetually incapable of doing what he has asked us to do? When speaking, I mean, you know, what, what do we think about parents who lay impossible demands on their children and then punish them because they don't succeed? Well, you don't ask a little two-year-old to run a marathon. You could. But God looks at us as a different states of maturity. Yeah. When speaking to the children of Israel, Moses said God's commands were not too difficult. It says it right there. In fact, look at it. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. The command that I'm giving you today is not too difficult or beyond your reach. It is not up in the sky. You do not have to ask who will go up and bring it down for us so that we can hear it and obey it and so forth. And he's talking about, of course, God's commands. Well, you know, Moses was a man that even violated God's commands. He killed yeah. someone. And so he knew God was forgiving and was 
teaching him to be a better person as time went on. Yeah. Well, more than that, and here, Dennis, time for you to speak up. Ellen White said repeatedly that God never asks us to do anything which is not for our best good. And there's a bunch of references, but unfortunately, these are references that are buried away in some places that aren't real easy to find. She first said that in Review and Herald, June 12, 1855, paragraph 7. And again, in April 12, 1887, paragraph 9. In a little collection of notebook leaflets that she put together, page 79, verse 1, and, and so forth. It's also in volume 4B of the Spiritual Gifts, page 7, paragraph 4. So what's the problem? If we recognize that what God wants for us is for our best good, shouldn't we always be willing to do His will, knowing it is for our best? Well, God yeah. says to rest. Easy, on... right? Not easy, <laughs> but we should at least, you know, try and, and hang around with others who do it, mm -hmm. or who also try. Mm -hmm. Iron sharpens iron. But He also promises to empower us mm -hmm. to achieve His uh, his commandments. Yeah. You know, it, it's if we will seek him, he will empower us. Then is yeah. God saying that the Sabbath where we're supposed to rest and take a whole day to uh, be with him is for our own good and it's not just a, a random uh, Exactly. Useless, not an arbitrary thing. Not yeah. an arbitrary thing. Uh, well, it works for Sunday too. Well, if Adam was our first ancestor, how do we explain all those fossils that people have dug up around the world? If the scriptures are true, then they cannot be ancestors of Adam. So how do we explain the existence of such fossils? What fossils are you talking well, about? Well, the ones that have been dug up. Zinjanthropus and, and all this. Well, they find a little piece of a jaw and yeah, they I say know. it belongs to a man and they the artist reconstructs the whole thing, so it depends on what you want to believe. Well, here in our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 44, we have this paragraph. First, the human-like fossils might be forms of humans with normal intelligence, but with growth patterns unlike any present-day human. How do we know that there weren't humans that looked a little bit different and acted a little bit different than we, ha than we are today? A second possibility is that the fossils may have been degenerate due to their own lifestyle or environmental stress or other factors. A third possibility is that they may be the results of Satan's direct attempts to corrupt creation in ways we do not understand. Another possibility is that they were not humans but were similar in morphology. They might have looked like humans, but they really weren't humans. Maybe they were some great apes. So the Nebraska man, yeah. maybe, maybe he wasn't human? Yeah. Since they did use a pig's tooth, though, to yeah. fashion the Nebraska man. So. <laughs> well, different people may prefer different explanations, but because we do not have direct evidence to settle the matter, it is best to avoid being dogmatic in our speculations. Fossils do not come with labels attached that say, made in China 500 million years ago, <laughs> or the like. Our understanding of Earth's history, which varies greatly among scientists, provides a frame of reference within which we interpret fossils. But we do not have proof of our interpretations. They are, in the end, only that, interpretations and nothing more. You know, that paragraph makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Why? I have to, I don't even okay, know or understand well, what they're talking about. Okay, let's, we know that, I mean, every little while, National Geographic, for example, comes out with a new article about some collection of bones that's found somewhere, and this obviously has to be an ancestor of human beings billions of years ago, or millions of years ago. And what he's saying here is, look, th that doesn't have to be true. Maybe those are deteriorating humans, not, not improving humans. Maybe, maybe they're not humans at all. Maybe they were some kind of apes that just look like humans. There are lots of other possibilities for those creatures that supposedly lived a long time ago, uh, they don't have to be related to Adam in any way. Well, I don't even know why they're given credence because they only find a few bones and it's the artist that makes the, the bones yeah. look like a person. So yeah. I'd have to study each one in depth and see. Uh, you know, I haven't heard anything from a scientist yeah. uh, because we have our creation scientists who talk about uh, these bones that they're finding. Yeah. Well, what are the... Imp oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
If I may suggest quickly, why? Why? Because some people want to live forever. They don't. Some, the ones who don't believe that God's going to come and salvation and all this, they want to find a way that they would be their own God, so they could find something and they can go live on another planet. You know, if they have enough money, enough uh, technology, and what have you. So. Mm-hmm. Well, and what are the implications of following our Darwinian understanding of human origins? People like Adolf Hitler, with his theories about a dominant race forced our world into a horrible war. And the results are most dramatically seen at places like Dachau and Auschwitz. Is there any doubt that, was, that, was sat- that those things were satanic in origin? In light of all this, where did our morality come from? That's the ultimate question we're trying to get to. The only safe answer is that we got it from our Father in Heaven. But notice some other explanations that have been given by people who do not choose to believe God's words. Julian Huxley argued that morality is itself a product of evolution. Thus, any standards of rightness and wrongness must in some way be related to the movement of that process, which is evolution, through time. Do you see people just naturally getting better and better through evolution? Well, ethically, I think people uh, who are not trained or taught that tend to go the other way. Mm -hmm. There's a degeneration of ethics and morality. Well, in the minute or so we have left, notice these words from Ellen White. The first great moral lesson given Adam was that of self-denial. The reins of self-government were placed in his hands. Judgment, reason, and conscience were to bear sway. Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, February 24, 1874. So which would you choose? A world dominated by Darwinian principles in which the strong are constantly dominating the weak and even eliminating them from the competition? Or a world dominated by God's principles of love and caring for the weak? Look at two more issues which are very important in this whole scenario. Judeo-Christian ethics and our belief that we are all made in the image of God necessitate our regarding human life with sanctity. Uh, Look at Genesis 9, 46, for example. They also necessitate our making moral choices based on the best understanding of the value of not only things, but also of individuals. If the house is burning and we have to choose which to rescue, we rescue the baby rather than the dog. What about our political system? Do we vote for what's right or vote what we think will help us the most? What are the implications of all of this? Well, we'll leave that with you to think about. Talk about it with your friends. Come up with your own conclusions. Join us next week.